Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Seventh Day Church of Revelation. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret to, unto his servants, the prophets. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be up here again. It's been a little while. And uh, the, uh, the scripture is uh, partly what inspired me to speak on this topic. And um, what it should tell us is that God does not want us to be surprised uh, by anything that he does. Um, he doesn't want us to be shocked or confused. He wants us to know what's going on around us when he's involved, uh, especially in time events where um, our salvation is at stake and our family's salvation is at stake. And so that's why I chose that verse, and uh, I believe it'll be a good theme to keep in mind as we, as we go through this study. So let's um, take a quick look at our title, Sunday Law May Not Happen. Um, this, um, it was a while back, someone uh, clued me in that there was a, a sermon that was given at a local Central California conference uh, symposium on um, end, time, end time events and how Sunday Law, um, this particular series, was a three-part uh, seminar by, this, uh, by the speaker, Dr. John Pauline, and it dealt with specifically Sunday Law and how, and how it interacted with end-time events. And so I, I listened to it, and I was um, concerned about a few things that, um, that he said, and probably more importantly, some of the approaches that he was taking when it came to not only Scripture, but specifically Ellen White, and uh, even more specifically, the great controversy. So Dr. Pauline uh, tends to take an approach called uh, historic critical method. And so what that is in a nutshell is you, you pay specific attention to um, the writer, so whether it be a Bible writer or Ellen White, you take specific or pay a speci specific attention to their culture, their context, their immediate context, and their knowledge, and um, more so than what those scriptures mean to you in your day. And uh, often uh, we can lose sight of what God has in store for us as we focus on those things, and we it. It also allows for us to dismiss um, things like the Sunday Law, because we read about the Sunday Law from writings that were penned uh, around the 1880s, and that's what he's going to stress. But that's not the only time Ellen White wrote about that. So we're going to take a look at that. We're going to look at uh, many of the speaker's quotes, and uh, also a few Ellen White quotes and a, and, a, and a handful of Bible quotes to help us through this study. So before we begin, uh, those that are able, let's kneel in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful that we are able to all come here and freely worship in freedom. And I also thank you for this, this nice place we have to worship. And and all the uh, beautiful souls that are here present and also watching. Um, I pray for not only myself, but them, that, that our minds would be clear in thought and that we would discern what you would have for us regarding the coming uh, conflict and Sunday laws that, that uh, are fast, fast approaching. And I pray that we will have a clear view of how you want us to um, uh, see these things so that we are not caught unaware, so that we will be ready, not just for Sunday laws to come, but that we will be ready uh, in our hearts, that our characters will be prepared and be ready uh, for your sons appearing in the clouds. And that is the most important thing of all. I pray these things not because I deserve an audience with the creator of the universe, but because your son 
purchase that right for me. In Jesus' name I pray. Okay, so through our study, we're going to just ask two simple questions and uh, use some of the quotes from the three sources to answer those questions. And our first question is, are Ellen White's Sunday Law prophecies conditional? Now, before I go any further, um, I just want you to know that there are different ways that things can be conditional, and we're, gonna, we're going to um, realize that as we move along. Because sometimes we think of conditional as it's either going to happen or it's not going to happen. And so I, I believe there is another way to look at this. I don't believe it's quite so black and white. So we're going to um, look at the speaker's first comment and maybe get a little peek into his uh, perspective regarding um, the conditionality or conditional nature of uh, scripture and spirit of prophecy. He stated, as a classical prophet, and that's how he labels Ellen White, Ellen White's prediction should be understood also as conditional, that as circumstances change, the fulfillment of Revelation 13 could take other forms than the ones that seemed so clear in 1888. Now, already, I, this sent up red flags for me because um, the other forms uh, phrase seemed very strange to me, because I want, myself, I want to see evidence, I want to see precedent in Scripture that conditional prophecies can take a left turn and take another form entirely. Um, and uh, I don't believe that we see evidence for that, but that's the, that's the phrase that he chose to use, other forms. And then, when he says that seemed so clear in 1888, so now you, you get an idea of where he's coming from. Um, Sunday law seemed so clear in 1888, and what does that imply? That all other times it doesn't seem so clear, right? And he's going to use other phrases to describe this too. So here is a Bible reference that's going to help lay a foundation on conditional prophecy. Find it in Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 7 through 10. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. And so this is the biblical standard for conditional prophecy. Do you see things taking a left turn? Does it say, I will do something else? I will do something totally different? No, it's either he's going to um, honor the repentant soul and not punish, or he will take away the blessing that he promised because of a turn in the recipient. It all is dependent upon the recipient and their actions. And that's, that's what I want you to notice mainly from this. Can you think of a Bible example, a Bible story, where we see this in action? What's that? Nineveh. Jonah, right? So, in that story, did the punishment take another form? It didn't take another form, right? And I know when we, when we learned this story growing up of Jonah, I know myself, I just assumed that Nineveh was spared, and they all lived happily ever after. But what's the truth about Nineveh? Did Nineveh live happily ever after? No. Nineveh was sacked. Nineveh was burned eventually. So what changed? First of all, what, what spared Nineveh? The repentance, right? 
And what would have had to happen, according to Jeremiah 18, for that to change? God's mind? Not necessarily. God has a a consistent standard. And that's one of John Pauline's um, principles, that God is consistent. And I agree with that principle. But something else changed. Nineveh changed, obviously. And so that prediction or prophecy that God gave ended up being fulfilled. It was just delayed. So we have an element of time delay there. And incidentally, it was uh, less than 150 years later, after Jonah's day, that Nineveh was, was destroyed. And uh, it, never, it never fully recovered from that. The Medes and the Persians, so that gives you a little time context, are the ones that overtook Nineveh. So Ellen White also has something to say about conditional prophecy. And I'm sure you've heard this before, but maybe not applied it exactly to um, Sunday law. And I don't believe it does apply to Sunday law. She writes, Our Savior did not appear as soon as we hoped. But has the word of the Lord failed? Never. It should be remembered that the promises and the threatenings of God are alike conditional. So does this fit, does this uh, quote fit with what we found in Jeremiah 18? Yeah, perfectly, right? She's just saying it in different words. So she has promises and threatenings, and those were the two categories that were mentioned in Jeremiah, promises and threatenings. And those are the things that are conditional. And it seems that they are conditional in reference to time. They are either delayed or they happen, right? So, um, it's not necessarily that the, the type of punishment changes or that the event changes itself. Now, notice um, in this particular example, what does she give? It is the second coming or the appearing of Jesus. And what does she follow that with? As soon as we hoped. So, um, Brother Inashku gave has given a couple presentations that touch on this. Why has Christ not come as soon as we had hoped? Because God changed his mind and he just didn't feel like it? No, because of the insubordination of his people, specifically his people. It's not just of the world. It's the insubordination of his people that delayed the second coming. Will the second coming happen? Or will he change his mind and do something in a different form? Should I expect something different than Christ coming in the clouds of heaven? No. So you see where, where, the, where the evidence leads is different from where the speaker is leading the listener, I believe. All right, and here is another quote. And this is uh, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, which incidentally is the great controversy 1884 edition so this preceded the 88 by four years she writes the movement for sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided the law is invoked against commandment keepers the <clears throat> they are threatened with fines and imprisonment and some are offered positions of influence and other rewards and advantages as inducements to renounce their faith But their steadfast answer is, show us from the word of God our error, the same plea that was made by Luther under similar circumstances. Now, there are some details in this this prophecy, right? I mean, she even puts a quote there as to the the attitude of God's faithful. Um, Do any of you doubt that this is going to happen? I don't doubt any of it. I don't even doubt the details that it will happen just like this. Um, But the speaker will lead your mind in a different direction, that we should not necessarily expect some of these things to happen. And uh, you'll see that as as we proceed. So this is is as far as I'm going to go on the aspect of conditional prophecy. I think we've We've done enough. I mean, I'm convinced, but 
it's not an exhaustive study that we've done. It's just real short, um, a couple examples. But I believe it will lay kind of a foundation for you as we tackle the next section and the next question. And I believe you, you may settle in your mind more fully on the question of conditional prophecy as we tackle the next section. And that question is, did Sunday laws only make sense in the 1880s? And that is, that is the basic theme of his third presentation, is that uh, Sunday laws uh, or enforced Sunday worship only made sense in the 1880s. And just to lay a little, a little uh, historical foundation, um, one of the reasons he's saying that is because of the historical context. What was happening in the, eight, the late 1880s that would lead Pauline to say, no, they only made sense right then? What was happening in Congress? The Blair Bill. There was actually a Sunday law that was in Congress. So that's the historical, uh, critical thinking coming through, that it wouldn't have made sense earlier in her ministry, the 40s and 50s and even the 60s, but in the 80s, it made sense for her to say these things because this is what was happening around her. That was her historical context. So let's go ahead and start reading some quotes by the speaker. He says, we would know that the American Congress would pass a national Sunday law. We would know that the president signs it. I think most Adventists would say, wow, this has got to be the final events. Time to get ready, if we're not ready already, and so forth. Very attractive idea, but is it accurate? Will things, in fact, happen exactly that way? That is the question. And then he says this phrase, which really hit me. God is not predictable. And that is one of his principles. He had a long list of principles. God is not predictable is one of those principles. And as a result, we need to be careful in the use that we make of such ideas. So what ideas is he talking about? Sunday laws, right? We need to be careful how we use, or the use that we make of such ideas, the ideas of there actually being a Sunday law on our horizon. So, um, one thing I want to point out, too, that I thought was strange, it's almost like a straw man argument, he's giving a fake quote, kind of, of um, what Adventist responses would be wow, this has got to be the final event, time to get ready if we're not already, and so forth. Now, I don't know anybody that believes the true gospel that also believes we're supposed to wait till we see Sunday legislation before we start to get ready. I don't know anybody like that. If I do, they're in error, because that's dangerous. You don't want to wait to get ready. When is the day of salvation? Today. So that... I didn't really appreciate that right there, and I don't know how he meant it, but I know how I took it, and it wasn't well. But the other thing that stood out to me was God is not predictable. Is that a true statement? I, I suppose it is a true statement in a certain context. But what that is implying is that we have no idea what God's going to do. He's unpredictable, and I don't believe that to be true. God is predictable in that he tells us, as we read in Amos, what he's going to do through his servants, the prophets, right? So he is precisely predictable as it pertains to the things that he has for us and our children. And so that is the main thing I want us to take away uh, from this presentation, is whether or not God wants us to be shocked and surprised at how he operates. I don't believe he does. He wants us to be comfortable. Not even comfortable, that's the wrong word. He wants us to be satisfied with how he operates because we know how he operates 
and we've signed on for it. We've surrendered our lives to him because we agree with how he operates. But to say God is not predictable, I believe put, plants a little seed of doubt in the viewer's mind regarding um, specifically Sunday laws. He also writes or says, we should be careful not to assume that the end time will be identical to the great controversy in every detail. Now this, this blindsided me. For example, the idea of a worldwide Sunday law already in action made a lot of sense in the 1800s because at the time the entire world was ruled by Christians. It's a colonial period and European uh, nations controlled Africa, South America, and large parts of Asia, etc. So the idea of a worldwide Sunday law made a lot of sense back then. The world is quite different today. So we should not assume that after the passage of more than 150 years or about 150 years that every detail would necessarily be fulfilled. Any red flags for any of you? Now, when you just watch this video through, it might not stand out to you. I mean, because he is very articulate. He is not, and I don't believe that he's being overtly irresponsible in his study or his presentation. But the underlying concepts and the direction that he's taking it, that's, that's what I'm having issue with. And uh, this is nothing against his character, but um, the direction that he's taking this and the direction that he's leading his audience is uh, what is putting up those red flags uh, for me. He says, if Ellen White were alive today, would she still be talking about Sunday laws? And if so, in what way would she be talking about them? How would these things work out in today's world? So again, he's, he's creating the separation then and now then and now, and he just continues to do this. And not only will he do that then and now, but then he goes back before 88 and creates a contrast between her early ministry and her later ministry. And uh, that's, that's usually um, a red flag. So anyway, he's, he's talking about then and now, and he's keying in on the 1880s. And I wanted to show you this slide, and I know you probably can't read it very well. It's really tiny, but I'll read the little part that I wanted to point out at the bottom, and this is a, this is a website called the Lord's Day Alliance. Um, some of you may have heard about the Lord's Day Alliance, uh, but they are a pro-Sunday uh, worship organization. But if you read about their history, it says the Lord's Day Alliance of the United States was founded in 1888. Why do you think they were founded in 1888? Oh, well, because it made a lot of sense back then, right, <laughs> to, to have Sunday laws. But who's still around? Who's got, a, who's got a nice website? And who has six major denominations around the world backing the Lord's Day Alliance? It's these guys. They used to be called um, American Sabbath Union. And you know what? I am glad that they're not called the American Sabbath Union because it's not the Sabbath right? I see that as providential. So if these, if these folks come on the stage and are prominent, it's the Lord's day, and that's not even true. We can, we, can, uh, we can disprove that one right away, but to have the word Sabbath in there um, is particularly offensive, right? Um, but I'm glad that it's, it's the Lord's day, at least, and we can we can educate people on which day is, uh, or who is the Lord of the Sabbath, right? So um, the idea that Sunday law makes just as much sense uh, as it did in 88 is what I wanted to point out here. Um, if anything, it makes more sense today than it did in 88, with or without legislation in the works. You know, I know that a lot of people were offended by uh, Elder Wilson saying there's nothing in the pipeline. I mean, to me, this is the pipeline. Yeah, there's nothing maybe overtly in legislation at this current time, but in my mind, that doesn't matter because Ellen White said it was going to happen, and she's the prophet, and I believe the prophet. And so I'm not, I don't check the paper every morning to see if Sunday law is happening. We're going to know, and I'm not, I'm not really overly concerned about that, but I am concerned with people... Uh, um, 
being led to not expect a Sunday law and to let their guard down. He continues, she does not address the world that we live in today directly. Her predictions are natural extensions of the world of her day. You will look in vain for a nuclear war or a nuclear power. You will look in vain for computers, internet, cell phones, space travel, world wars, Islamic terrorism, rise of secularism, rise of postmodernism, and so on. She does not address our world. That is typical of the Bible prophets. They spoke to their world. <laughs> More red flags, right? <laughs> what is, who is prophecy written for? Primarily the people in the day of the prophet? If the prophecy is going to be fulfilled in their day, yes. And like Brother Inashku has said, ere this, Christ could have come, right? And so, yes, it would have been for the people in her day if they would not have been insubordinate in their duty. But um, I thought this was particularly interesting. She does not address the world that we live in today directly. Um, this is more of the historical criticism coming through. Uh, that's kind of the, um, the general leaning that you'll get when you uh, listen or read a historical critical thinker. Um, so, if this isn't true, let's ask one of the prophets who disagrees with the, the, this uh, current speaker that we're looking at, and that's Ellen White. She writes, The prophets of God spoke less of their own time than for the ages to come, and especially for the generation that would live amid the last scenes of Earth's history. Who's right? The speaker or Ellen White? She goes on in another Quote, the prophets spoke less of their own time than for the ages which have followed for our own day. So she doesn't subscribe to that same philosophy that prophets wrote for their own day within their own context and they didn't understand what was going to happen in the future. She said the prophets write for the day of the fulfillment or for those that would be alive during the day of the fulfillment. And it's possible that... Uh, that the issue might be that if you are a speaker and you lean towards historical critical thinking and you don't believe that God's people have anything to do with the coming, the timing of the coming of Christ, that you would lean that direction. But we know that God's people do play a part, play a role in the timing of the coming of Christ. And so I believe that idea is probably not foreign to the speaker, but um, he probably does not agree with that concept, that Christ is, is waiting for the character, uh, his character to be reproduced in his, in his people. And, and that's when he will come to claim them as his own. Um, I, don't, I don't know that the speaker would agree with that. So anyway, Ellen White disagrees with that concept. And uh, so now, uh, now he continues to build on uh, some of these ideas and concepts that he has regarding uh, the great controversy and Sunday law. He writes in earlier editions, and really there's only one earlier edition that he's talking about. He says it in the plural. I think he believes there's seven. There's, there's, you ask the white estate, there are four editions. And the 58 is really what he's talking about. He's trying to take the mind back pre-1880s. So, 1858. You have no mention of a Sunday law in Congress. And this is a true statement. In the 58 Great Controversy, there is no mention of Sunday law in Congress. He is right about that. Um, and I don't have anything else to say about it. He's right. But where he's leading the mind is wrong. And uh, we'll continue to see where he's leading the mind. Now, this, um, this next quote, I believe, is, yes. Now, this next quote is an Ellen White quote, but it is the Ellen White quote that the speaker presented in his third presentation. So he reads this off the screen during his presentation. Um, 
Then I saw the mother of harlots, that the mother was not the daughters, but separate and distinct from them. She has had her day, and it has passed, and her daughters, Protestant sects, were next to come on the stage and act out the same mind that the mother had when she persecuted the saints. I saw that as the mother has been declining in power, the daughters have been growing, and soon they will exercise the power once manifested by the mother. And he kind of presents this as evidence that, see, there's no mention of Sunday law back in the 1850s. She's just talking about vague ideas of um, Catholicism losing its influence and Protestantism gaining its influence. Because his point is, in a world where Protestants have the supremacy and Catholics don't, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Right? And so he's trying to paint this contrast, really, between the, the 1840s and 50s and the 1880s. And he continues to do this. He then goes back and says, in, the 1850, in 1850, Catholics made up about 5% of the American population, and they had no influence on the government or on the main function of the United States. Within that time and place, there's historical criticism, 1850, this statement makes perfect sense. Catholicism is not going to be central if the Sunday law or any of that were to happen in the next few years, so in the next few years after she wrote this. It is a Protestant government, as she said, her daughters, the Protestant sects that were next to come on the stage and act out the same mind that the mother had when she persecuted the saints, past tense. So he's basically saying, well, you don't have Catholicism in power. If there was a Sunday law back then, they would have very little to do with it because they don't have influence. So he's looking at the historical context of the United States and saying it would have been a lot different back then because Catholics wouldn't have been involved and you wouldn't have heard about them. But he contrasts that with uh, the 1880s. Then he reads this off the screen. This is his Ellen White quote, which is a true quote. The Christian world has sanctioned his efforts by adopting this child of the papacy, the Sunday institution. They have nourished it and have continued to nourish it until Protestantism shall give the hand of fellowship to the Roman power. Then there will be a law against the Sabbath of God's creation. Now notice the date. 1886. And so now he's taking the mind forward in time and showing a different context. And now she's writing about Sunday law. He's trying to get you to believe that she didn't write about Sunday law back then. But now she's writing about Sunday law, and the, the stage is different. And now it makes sense, right? We've already seen him uh, use that phrase. But I want you to also notice here that hand of fellowship, does that remind you of anything? The reaching across the gulf, right? It's the same, the same imagery. Uh, law against the Sabbath, you've basically got Sunday law there. Um, now remember that uh, I pointed out the 1850 Manuscript 15 quote, that first one that we read where he was like, no mention, no mention of Sunday law. Well, what he didn't do is he failed to read the next two paragraphs to the viewers. And I find it hard to believe that a scholar of his caliber didn't realize what the next two paragraphs said. But you're going to get to see what the next two paragraphs said. So this is not what he read. This is what I'm sharing with you. This is the very next paragraph. I saw that the nominal churches and nominal Adventists, like Judas, would betray us to the Catholics to obtain their influence to come against the saints. The saints will be an obscure people, but little known to the Catholics. Uh, but the church and nominal Adventists will know of our faith and customs and will betray the saints and report them to the Catholics. That's sobering, right? Kind of fits from our perspective as those who disregard the institution of the Pope. That is, they keep the Sabbath and disregard Sunday. And this continues on the next slide. 
This is the next paragraph. Then the Catholics bid the Protestants to go forward and issue a decree that all who would not observe the first day of the week instead of the seventh shall be slain. And the Catholics, whose numbers are large, this is 1850, this is the same article, will stand by the Protestants. The Catholics will give their power to the image of the beast, and the Protestants will work as their mother worked before them to destroy the saints. But before their decrees bring forth or bear fruit, the saints will be delivered by the voice of God. So, first of all, I want to ask you, what is a decree? It's a law. Okay, so right there in the third paragraph of the 1850 article, it says there will be a law, and it says, all who do not observe the first day of the week. What's the first day, first day of the week? It's Sunday. So what do you have? You have Sunday Law in 1850. So Ellen White wrote about Sunday Law in 1850. Now, was it in the 1858 Great Controversy? No. But she was well aware of it, and it was true. I believe these words, and they're not incompatible what was written in 1888 or 1911. They're perfectly compatible. There's nothing, there's no new method that God is using here. It's the same thing. It's just different words. We even see the phrase, stand by the Protestants. They're reaching across the gulf. It's just a different way to say it. Are they literally going to be standing by the Protestants? No. Are they literally reaching across the gulf? No. It's just a different way to say the exact same thing. And this is in 1850. And ironically, it's out of the same article, one paragraph away from what he revealed to his viewers. So he, he continues here. When Ellen White speaks about Protestantism reaching, out its, reaching its hand across the gulf to grasp Catholicism and spiritualism, a threefold unity, that is a beautiful description of exactly the political situation of the United States in the 1880s when Sunday Law was introduced. So he, d he didn't tell you what she said, which is these precise words minus the spiritualism. He didn't tell you about that in 1850, that she wrote it in 1850, but then he contrasts what he did tell you with what he believes was pertinent or relevant in the 1880s. Um, not, not exactly fair to the viewer. So now I have um, a couple more quotes from Ellen White that should uh, help us settle this issue. She writes, many smiled and would not believe when we told them 20 and 30 years ago that the Sunday would be urged upon all the world and the law would be made to compel its observance and force conscience. We see it being fulfilled. All that God has said of the future will surely come to pass. Not one thing will fail of all that he has spoken. Protestantism is now reaching hands across the gulf to clasp hands with the papacy, and a confederacy is being formed to trample out the site of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. Now, this is in 82, so this is well before legislation. So this is in 1882, but what does she say in that uh, first line? 20 and 30 years ago, she was saying these things. So do you believe her? We read proof, but she's taking it further back. I mean, she's taking it all the way back to, well, this one she's only taking back to 62 and 52. But uh, she takes it back even further. She says, test, the test will surely come. And will it happen? She says it will surely come, right? 36 years ago, I was shown that what is now transpiring would take place, that the observance of an institution of the papacy would be enforced upon the people by a Sunday law, while the sanctified rest day of Jehovah would be trampled underfoot. This is uh, Testimonies, Volume 5, written in 1882. So 30, she's specific this time, 36 years before this. That takes you back to uh, 1846. Two years after the disappointment, 
she is saying that she was well aware of Sunday laws. And she says that test will surely come. So I have no doubt that what she wrote and what she believed in the 40s, the 50s, the 70s, 80s, and 1911 is going to take place. And we already read that she said that all of it will take place. She didn't really leave too much wiggle room for all, well, don't expect this all to happen, just as I have written. She never said that. She says just the opposite. She writes, a time is coming when the law of God is, in a special sense, to be made void in our land. The rulers of our nation will, by legislative enactments, enforce the Sunday law, and thus God's people uh, be brought into uh, great peril. When our nation, in its legislative councils, shall enact laws to bind the consciences of men in regard to their religious privileges, enforcing Sunday observance, and bringing an oppressive power to bear against those who keep this Seventh-day Sabbath, the law of God will, to all intents and purposes, be made void in our land. And this is a familiar phrase to you. And national apostasy will be followed by what? National ruin. Now, we're all familiar with that. This was written in that, that date that he alludes to over and over, 1888. But it doesn't make it any more true or relevant in that day than it is today because she wrote it. And I do not believe these uh, elements, that we see any evidence that the elements of Sunday law prophecy are conditional. Now, is the timing conditional? We have so much evidence that says the timing of Sunday law is conditional. Because what is God waiting for? He's waiting for his people. So the timing, yes, Sunday law is a conditional prophecy. The elements and the form, I don't believe so. I don't believe we have any precedent or any evidence that says that God is going to change his mind and make another test, or that he's going to change his mind and find another nation other than the United States to represent the lamb-like beast. We see no evidence for that. If that were to happen, Adventism would crumble. All the prophetic interpretation that we've stood on as a people would just crumble. And I do not believe that to be the case. And this is our last quote. And this is pretty much the reason why I'm giving this presentation. This is the reason for my warning about this approach to Scripture and this approach to Sunday law. She writes, Satan is so constantly pressing in the spurious to lead away from the truth. The very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. Were there no vision, where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29, 18. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. And I am giving this message today to reassure you that there is no reason for you to be unsettled in your confidence in the testimonies. There is every reason to believe every word you read that God has given to you. Uh, when Ellen White uh, writes about Sunday laws, we should have every confidence that what she's saying is true and will be fulfilled. Um, there were phrases like every detail or um, all the aspects of, of what she wrote. Um, I still have no doubt that the details, even the details, and she didn't write many details about Sunday law. They're pretty, pretty broad statements, and I believe we can take those to the bank. And there's no, uh, we have no precedent, uh, no reason to lose confidence uh, in what she wrote about Sunday Law. And uh, like I said, uh, we don't, I don't see this particular problem so much in this movement, um, historical critical thinking, and uh, that way of looking at scripture and inspiration. But what I am seeing is a troubling trend that is related to this, and that is picking and choosing uh, which portions of Ellen White's writings we're going to deem as trustworthy. 
and which ones we're going to label as being tampered with. That, um, that is a trend that has been in this movement for decades. Um, many have been led out of the truth because of that. And it's, um, it's on the rise again. And so I look forward to either myself or one of the other men to give a presentation um, on that particular issue soon because um, I don't believe it holds any weight. It is, it is a conspiracy theory, but I believe it is false. And uh, I hope that we have time soon to go through and uh, look at the evidence, the real evidence of whether or not Ellen White's writings were comp compromised, and I believe they were not. And so th those are the basic reasons why I gave the presentation today and didn't have time to cover both of uh, those aspects, but um, I hope that uh, this has been an encouragement to all to uh, dig deeper on this topic and to uh, be aware and find a new found appreciation for Ellen White's writing, specifically what she wrote about Sunday Law. So those that are able, let's close in a word of prayer and ask God to bless this time that we've had together. Dear Father in heaven, we, we are so grateful for the testimonies that you've given through Ellen White. I pray that we would not be fanatical or take things that she wrote uh, out of their context um, through which they were written, but I also pray that we would hold on to those things that you have for us in those writings and that they would encourage us to not just get ready or be prepared for a Sunday law to come, but rather be prepared uh, in our characters, be prepared um, uh, in our minds to meet you face to face. Uh, we know that the warning given in the great controversy about the character that we must have uh, relates to Christ and how he responded to sin. There was nothing in him that Satan could find uh, to get him to sin. And there was not even by a thought could he be uh, tempted to yield to, uh, to Satan's temptations. And so uh, we are also told that that is the condition we must be in if we are to stand during that time of trouble. And so I pray that we would strive for that character perfection, allow you to work in us, and so that we are ready in character for the soon coming of your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. If you have been blessed by this video and would like to support the Seventh-day Church of Revelation, please visit us at revelation.org.